Good evening, fighting staffs. My name is Jordan Sherpy Lencioni, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement here at Monmouth College. I want to welcome you this evening for our event, Sipping with the Scots Beer Edition for Golden Scots with Dr. Brad Sturgeon, Merman Class of 1980. We're thrilled that everybody is able to join us this evening. Before we begin, just to cover a few housekeeping items, um, today's event will be recorded and available on the Monmouth College website. For the best viewing experience, we recommend that you put your computer into speaker mode throughout the presentation that is located up in the right upper hand corner of your screen. Attendees will be able to ask questions and chat throughout the event. The At the end, we will give you the option to turn on your screen for some questions and conversations with Brad. Yeah. At the end of the event, you'll also see a short three minute survey pop up on your screen. Please feel free to fill that out for us. We'll also send you a bigger survey at the end of the Golden Scouts weekend. A little bit about our presenters today. Brad Sturgeon attended Illinois State University and received both his BS and MS in chemistry in 1987 and 1989 respectively. He then went on to receive his PhD from the University of California, Davis in 1994. Brad joined the faculty at Monmouth in 2007 and is currently an associate professor of chemistry with a focus of chem oh, physical chemistry. Next turn. His business partner, Dr. Steve oh. Merman, graduated from Monmouth College in 1980 and went on to the <clears> University <throat> of Missouri, Kansas City, where he received his DDS in 1985. Steve owned and operated his own clinic here in Monmouth for over 30 years and is currently a dentist with the Warren County Dental Clinic here in Monmouth. Brad and Steve may also share a little bit about their science-based business connection that began with the Monmouth College Coffee Project in 2010, which involved into a brewery partnership with their company, DeNovo Beverage. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Welcome. Greetings, everyone. <laughs> nice to see you all here. Cheers. I don't know if you guys were as, uh, we were a bit parched, so we had to crack into one of our beers before we started. It's been, a, it's been a long day. It's been a long day. So actually, and I'm excited about today because uh, today was the start of the Keefe Summer Research Program. And for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, Doc Keefe endowed a couple of different programs at the college. And one of them is he wanted to make sure that the students were engaged during the summer. So we have 12 students and six faculty members this summer who just started today. And we'll be on campus for the next eight weeks, working a standard 40 plus hour a week, uh, trying to get some research done. So we're pretty excited about that. So that sounds like fun. Yeah, so anyway, you want us sure. to uh, talk a little bit about, I guess, uh, I'm not sure who's there, we can't see who's there, but about how DeNovo and how we've evolved now into the patent block. Well, as you, for those of you who were here for the last one, which would have been the first one, as, as I understand it, uh, you know that Brad and I uh, met uh, under the, the glare of a dental light when I was fixing some teeth. And we, uh, what started off as a crazy idea of opening a brewery uh, actually happened. That would have been 2013 14. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I don't know. I just have to go yeah. look at the beer glasses and see yeah. how far it goes back. But yeah. and uh, we operated uh, as an independent brewery for for uh, five or six years, and then uh, a couple of years ago, uh, some people came to us, the Gavins, uh, with the interest in in opening a brew pub and asked us to join them, which we did. So uh, we now are a part of the Pattenbach Grill and Brew Pub, which has fantastic food. And, uh, and our beer uh, that goes along with it. So the next time you're in town, you'll have to stop by for a pint and maybe a bite to eat. Yeah, very good. Well, I guess if, uh, again, I, I think uh, the chat is open and if you guys have any questions along the way, you can uh, feel free to uh, type those into the window and uh, we will. Uh, Somebody will tell us because we I can't read that. Yeah, we can't read it that from that far away. But uh, but again, we'll uh, go ahead and type in there, and whenever there's a break, we'll respond to those yeah, things. So, um, hey, so uh, again, uh, just uh, surreal basics about uh, beer. Uh, beer's uh, a very very complex mixture, but it really comes from three main ingredients, really four ingredients, but. 
you have your yeast, you have grain, of course, you have hops, and then you have water. And I think Steve and I have talked a lot about water in the past, so we're going to hold off on that. Um, but uh, the yeast is one thing that can uh, really add a component to the beer. So in the, the listing that we gave you, there's essentially the German wheat beer is the first one, and then the Cezanne. So those two are kind of yeast focused. Um, and, uh, and then the next two, the American IPA and the New England hazy IPA are ones that are sort of focused on the hop component. And then the last two are the very dark or the darker beers, the Porter and the Imperial Stout, which we'll talk about these individually. So Steve, it's time to pop open. Uh, what do we got I was there? Gonna say, I was wondering why yeah. we were punishing folks <laughs> by not letting them nurse their beer. Yes, please open your uh, we'll your uh, wheat beer, your we'll Hefeweizen. Start. We'll start off. This is yeah. uh, the wine from the wine, wine Stefan Stefan yeah, brewery <laughs> in uh, Germany. Yeah, and and so th this being a yeast focused beer, it's even in the title because Hefe or Hefeweizen, so Hefe means wheat, uh, yeast, and Weizen means wheat. So this is essentially a wheat, thank you. This is a, a, a yeast wheat beer, right? And uh, so again, just to give you a little bit of a, a background on how to evaluate these things too, uh, I like to look at them and then I like to smell them and then I like to taste them and then I think about it, right? So one of the things you can tell about a wheat beer is the head on a wheat beer is always very, very white. Uh, so it's not tan like you'll see on some other beers. So again, this beer, uh, this one's pretty clear. Um, I think I bought this a while ago. It was sort of in my collection at home. So I bet if we... Uh, Sometimes wheat beers, people have a tendency to roll them on the table because there was yeast active in that that uh, solution before. There is some. It's fun. Is there in there? Here, pour me a little bit of uh, yeast goodness in there. See if we can get some. Uh... Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, so we we should have rolled it uh, in order to uh, to get that yeast to kind of get kicked up. Um, but uh, now I'm going to, after looking at it, I'm going to smell it now. And one of the things that we clearly note is that there's oftentimes referred to as a banana aroma. Um, people generally say banana in cloves, but those two things kind of blend together. The banana or the isoamyl acetate is sort of the primary aroma component. So, and now I'm going to sip it. Cheers. <laughs> I didn't wait. I have great. I know. I know the the beer's coming. So uh. one thing about this beer, the the German Hefeweizen is one of those beers where it's dramatically different if you drink it when it's fresh as opposed to after it's been sitting on a ship, getting shipped over here from Germany. So if you go into a, a craft brewery and uh, get a Hefeweizen that's fresh, it's going to taste dramatically different than this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can barely pick up on the banana. Yeah, it's pretty light. Yeah. So, whereas uh, when we made it, it it's really stood out. Actually, it was almost too much in your face because we're used to drinking commercials. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and so one of the things also about the wheat beers is that you may have, depending on what wheat beer you picked up, uh, again, this one is from Germany. It's imported from Germany. Uh, but if you have an American wheat beer, like one of the um, the most common ones right now is Goose Island 312. Uh, that beer is an American wheat beer. So they do not use the fancier Wein and Stefan or yeast. And so that yeast, um, so the American wheat beers don't have this sort of aroma and some of the character that you would find in a German wheat beer. So, um, so anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. And uh, yeah, so uh, so I guess we can just keep uh, knocking through here. Did you? Did we have a question? Yeah. Yeah. Repeat the question for sure. Okay. Gary Sears, class of seventy. Okay. 
as their alcohol um, levels different in the beers. So, yeah, so we should have pointed out the alcohol levels of the beers. That was what the question was. I think generally this wheat beer is about a 5%. That's, if it doesn't list it, it's somewhere around four to six uh, alcohol by volume. Um, so again, there's some technicality. It's not alcohol by weight. 5.4, it said. Oh, okay. So 5.4% alcohol in a wheat beer. Uh, pretty much a standard um, um, alcohol content. Most beers so, are five, uh, at least craft beers are going to be five to seven. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Uh, unless you get into the imperial side of things. Yeah. Well, and there's an interesting thing that may happen, you know, when you produce alcohol during the fermentation process, you do have some inhibitory effects on the yeast. So, um, you know, so, so in some ways that sort of five to seven is sort of a good point uh, for a beer to get to, right? So it kind of evolved before in that the, way. Before the alcohol starts slowing down the yeast. Yeah, and the other beers that are a little bit higher in alcohol, what are, what are called high gravity beers because they start off with a lot of sugar, so they're high density, right? So they call them high gravity beers. Uh, but they tend to, you kind of have to work a little bit harder to get that fermentation to come up yeah. above that. We'll seven. get to a really high alcohol. Yeah, beer, and beer over here is a, a big boy. So, all right. So, Steve, we got uh, our next beer is our Cezanne. And what's that nice fancy bottle you got there? Oh. <laughs> this is a growler from the Patton Block Grill and Brew Pub. That's right. Yeah, we... Uh, Actually, sometimes beers, uh, and again, I'd be interested to see if everybody was able to get their saison. Um, they sometimes are a little specialty. Depends on what kind of uh, uh, place you went to uh, uh, buy your beers, uh, whether they had had those or not. Thank you. There you go. If we keep drinking an entire glass each time, we may not get through this. <laughs> I'm going to keep mine in order over here just in case. So, um, so the same thing with this guy. This uh, Cezanne, I think, is half wheat. So it should have a nice white head to it as well. Uh, cheers. A um, little bit cloudy, which is perfectly fine. Um, and again, the aroma on this, instead of the banana kind of aroma that you get with the German wheat, you get some more like coriander and I don't know, orange peel or orange, I don't know. There's lots they, of different things. Yeah, they just come <laughs> up with names so that it, they, because they don't want to say it, it tastes like the sole of a shoe. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? Yeah, well, that's right. Yeah, and it sometimes the descriptors actually, yeah, sometimes they tend to be a little bit more farmhousey. Yeah. Okay. Or um, I the, the term I guess I like is the wet blanket. So it kind of smells like a wet blanket, and you're going like, mm, Again, yum, let's get into what that. Sounds, what sounds more appealing, <laughs> coriander or a wet blanket? Or a wet blanket. <laughs> uh, so call me silly. Mm hmm. So this is a Belgian style beer. Uh, the yeast, mm -hmm. from what I understand, traditionally uh, Belgians uh, brewed beer along the coast and they would uh, put their beer in big, instead of tanks, uh, they put them in, in open topped uh, trays, basically, am mm -hmm. I right? And then yeah. you open the, open the window and, and the breeze would blow in off of the ocean and this is the yeast that came. That would work. Yeah. Right? I mean, the Belgians have done all kinds of weird things. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, but it's weird to get a yeast that can put these kinds of characters into the beer. Um, and actually this beer, when we made it down at the patent block, um, our lab manager, who is a, uh, a Monmouth uh, graduate of uh, 2006, 2007, but uh, he did, he's a home brewer, and so he made this Cezanne, and he paid about 
$15 for a little vial of this sort of specialty yeast. And so, but after he made his five gallons of beer, then that one vial turned into about 10 vials. And so we talked to him. And so when he was finished with his yeast, we then pitched it into ours. Yeah. So, so we kind of reused yeast a little bit because yeah, we're a little conservative. We didn't want to spend $150 for a pitch of yeast when right. we usually spend somewhere around $10 to $20 for a, p- a pitch of yeast. So we got to keep that business stuff in mind uh, while we're making these beers. So, um, so uh, some of you may be asking, why does a Belgian beer have a French name? Hey, Steve, why does a Belgian beer have a French name? Well, it turns out <laughs> that on the southern, I think it's the southern part of Belgium, there's a ah. French speaking area. Ah. Uh, and that's where this beer came wow. out of the French speaking part I, of Belgium. I did not know that. I didn't either. So, but. <laughs> uh, the other thing about this beer that is good, I think is that this name, if you went down to Patton Block to, and asked for a pint of this beer, you would ask for a celebration ale. And so this is the beer that Steve and I brewed in celebration of the class of 2021. So this is something that we're gonna start to do each year when the Monmouth College graduates are getting ready to walk across the stage, we'll release a, a celebration ale for them. And so, um, we're not supposed to give away free beer, but I think we told the students if they went down there, they just say they're graduating and they got a free pint of beer. They? Oh, yes. Sorry, I'm not supposed to tell. In them. other words, what, what you're saying is that if they went down there, then we would buy them. A, we would buy them yeah, a pint okay. of beer. That's exactly right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so. That way, uh, that, that keeps us out of trouble. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. That's we all serve roles in this uh, yeah. this business partnership, right? <laughs> Minus the, the legalese. That's right. So, so again, just to remind you of sort of our strategy here, those first two beers are yeast-focused or yeast-centric beers. Um, very standard grain bill, very few hops in there. Um, nothing really special about the brewing or anything like that. When we move to the next two beers. So the only real difference in these two beers is the yeast, right? Yeah, pretty much I mean, so. The grains are about the same. The yeast is, or the hops is about the same. The only difference is the type of yeast that we yep. use, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, so again, you can make a beer very, very different just by changing any one of the three components. And you can even change the water profile, the fourth one, so you get some other uh, different, uh, different, uh, uh, profile. So actually, I believe I, I asked my lab manager to come over and help us drink some of this beer. And so if you see him walk over here in the door, there he is. We just poured your beer, Steve. So, so we're going to pour you this is on as we go. (laughs) There you go. Yeah. So, well, it's all good. I didn't want to make him necessarily come on camera, but he's he's uh, he's he's good. I I had all these nice beers. And I just didn't want him to go to waste. So, well, no. <laughs> um, hey, so yeah, so we're gonna now move into the hop focused beers, and so the two hop focused beers we Should have. Should we see if there are any questions first? Oh yeah, yeah. Good good idea. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Thanks, Merman. I, apparently, Merman in distance. No, okay. Apparently the room. So, all right. All right. We'll so, so the hop component, uh, there's a lot of stories associated with hops, but uh, this beer right here is actually called Hop Slam. It's from uh, Bells. Bells. And uh, out of Michigan. Yeah. And this beer, supposedly, when they put it out in the store, it's gone off the shelf in a very short time, but. Then they always come out with a second batch and you're able to sometimes find it. So, but this this is a very aggressive beer that we have. And again, it's an American IPA. Sometimes they refer to them as a West Coast IPA because they put a lot of hops in the very, very beginning of the brew day, uh, of the brew cycle. 
and that gives the very very bitter flavor so let's let's go back just a second to, to okay alcohol. you talk i'll pour to alcohol mm -hmm. so we were at 5.4 this was five give or take yeah okay mm -hmm. and uh this one is 10. oh is that right yeah so don't drink very much if you want to drive home so this is technically an imperial an imperial it does oh. but it doesn't say that on the label does yeah, it, it does actually oh geez all right. Sorry, my bad. That's the only reason why I knew, because <laughs> I looked on there and somewhere on there it said Imperial. Well, I'm, Imperial IPA. I pulled the wrong beer out of my collection there, I guess. Uh, yeah, a standard. Oh, double. It says double India. Pen. Oh, well, that's small print, Steve. I can't read that. Well, I'm older <laughs> than you, and I can read it. Uh, yeah, a standard IPA or standard West Coast IPA is going to be, seven, you know, six, six yeah, and six and, seven, and a half, seven. seven. Sometimes they stretch it a little bit on the IPAs. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it could be, um, I guess, Sierra Nevada, the most traditional sort of pale ale beer um, is, you know, sort of a, the, the entry into the IPA. Um, but uh, uh, what's 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 the uh, the bells? Uh, well, two, like hearted. two hearted. Two hearted is seven. Yeah. Okay. So two hearted ale, even though they don't say it on the label, I don't think is an IPA. Yeah. Uh, they they sometimes don't like to tell you a style like they're restricting themselves in some way. Um, but again, this beer very different, a little darker in color. Uh, the head on this beer, because it does not have a lot of weed in it, is kind of a, a tan or off-white. And uh, the, the aroma on an IPA should have some citrus or florally notes to it um, that are from the hops added at different points in the brewing process. And when you sample it, it should have a very bitter um, the finish should be very dry. Um, now we have to pretend because we have an imperial and it won't be quite as dry, I don't think. I don't know. It's pretty dry. It does have that dryness, but ours is a little sweet because yeah. of that imperial nature. Mm -hmm. um, so, but so, so one of the things you get from the commercials on TV is that they say things like uh, this Miller is triple hopped. So there's actually three different kind of places that you can add hops in the brewing process. So you essentially have a big, you know, a kettle of sort of the, uh, the sugar water from, from the extraction of the grains. So if you throw hops in really early, then you get bitterness. If you add them in the middle, you get kind of flavor. And if you add them at the very late part, you get aroma. So that sounds really good in a textbook and on a diagram. Although most brewers use other kinds of strategies to get hop components. So you want to tell them about our new way we're, we're making our hazy? Well, the, you've got bitter, you've got flavor, and you've got aroma. And so we've we've come to the conclusion that uh, uh, where we use the bittering hops at the very beginning of the boil, so so you get the maximum amount of transformation of the of the alpha acids uh, to give to get the bitter, and then we've begun to uh, do nothing until the very end, and we remove the heat and cool uh, the sugar liquid down to about 180 and then we stir in a bunch of hops at that point. Um, and you tend to get a uh, good flavor from that and also reasonable aroma as well. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I, I don't know why we didn't think of this before, or maybe we didn't ask the right people, but you know, when you, when you have near boiling wort is what we call it, the sugar water sort of in the boil kettle, you know, you throw the hops in there, a lot of those really delicate sort of citrusy aromatic, aromatic things. compounds. Yeah. Things that you smell. Yeah. And it smells great in the brewery when you throw it in there, but then it's not in your beer anymore. So by lowering the temperature to about 180 
and dropping the hops in there really allows us to retain a lot of that flavor. At least and, more, yeah. Yeah, at least more. We've um, been, I've been really happy with that uh, yeah. changing strategy. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting. So, so again, we're we're still learning about our process um, as as we go through this too. So, yeah. um, so to contrast the that IPA, i.e., imperial, but on our end, yeah. but <laughs> with a hazy. So again, the the IPA is generally called a West Coast IPA because it originated up in Oregon when you, it's a really great location for growing hops. Um, so the hazy IPA is the New England style uh, IPA. And so the, you know, the East Coasters had to get their, their hand into the uh, hop. Uh, well, essentially hop. what it comes down to is that the West Coast people throw the hops in at the beginning of the boil, and the East Coast people throw their hops in uh, at the very end. So it's not very bitter. If you if you like the the smell of hops, uh, but you don't like the fact that it makes you pucker, then the east the uh, east coast or hazy IPA uh, might be a beer that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, the grain the grain bill is uh, again probably more similar to these, um, in the sense that it's. It usually has some wheat, and that's where the uh, the hazy comes from. Um, but unlike these two, it just, um, we got your beer over here. <laughs> unlike these two, uh, this beer has uh, has a lot of hops in it, and so uh, while the main flavor in these is yeast generated, uh, the main flavor in this is uh, uh, hop generated. Yep. But and, you'll notice it's a little hazy, mm -hmm. and that's from the wheat and and oats and whatever else they happen to toss in. Yeah, um, yeah, and the water profile is a lot different on the east coast and is on the west coast, so sometimes that prevent or promotes that. Yeah. Um, to be honest, this is my go-to beer now. I enjoy this beer more than um, more than I do some of the others. Just yeah, and. And one of the things, that, again, like Steve said, with the Hefeweizen, if you get it fresh, it tends to be much better than sort of a bottle or canned product. And this, this is top of the list of that. Yeah, yeah. And these lose, guys. You lose the hop character uh, fairly quickly yep. within just a few months. When I think with this one, this is called uh, Get a Little Hazy. I don't know who's the, the brewery. Um it's from Iowa, Peace I think. Peace Tree Brewing. Peach Tree Brewing. Peace. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, but I I think what tends to go in the beer is the aroma, and the uh, the but the flavors there, but there's very little bitterness in yeah, here. So it's again, not any bitter. Even my wife likes the hazy. Yeah. Day. So and she doesn't like beer. Period. Yeah, and here let me tell you something about this can. I saw Steve over there picking at this. So one of the things that I do when I go in to buy beer and I'm not looking for anything specific, uh, notice this can here has a label on it. And so I know that uh, some of you in your older days might have pulled labels off of beer bottles or whatever. Um, but but uh, when you find a can where you can pull this label off here like this, this is a very small brewery. Uh, they probably don't have canning facilities on site. And what they'll do is that they'll hire somebody to come in and uh, they'll have all their beer ready to go. And they come in and set up a mobile canning station. And then they, they can whatever they have on site. And they, you know, they set up this canning site and then they can all the beer and then they take it down. And of course you have to use this label. Um, you know, if you have a can that is pre-printed, that's you quite expensive. By, you have to buy that by the truckload. Yeah. So, I mean, to get a talking, decent deal. You're talking 30,000 cans. Or, or 200,000. Yeah, or right. 200,000. Yeah. I've heard 200,000, but. As a minimum yeah. order. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is a support your local brewery. Yeah. Kind of thing. So if you that's see. That's right. Support you your see, local brewery. <laughs> you see labels. It makes a good. Uh, I don't know. I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of nice. 
So, so the last two beers, these have been uh, uh, more yeast. The flavors have been more yeast generated. Uh, these have been beers that have been where the flavors, as a general rule, are more uh, hop generated. And what do we got left? So, so actually on our list here, we have a porter. So this is a porter from Cleveland. And uh, it's the Edmund Fitzgerald Porter. Um, Great Lakes. Great Lakes Brewery. Great Lakes Brewery. Yeah, they started up. I think we have a couple of alumni out in that neck of the woods there. Uh, so I drink a lot of Great Lakes over the years. Yeah. In Michigan. Let me have one more. And. Yeah, now, so when you, again, this idea of looking, you know, starting off by looking at the beer, this is very, very clearly a darker beer. Um, you really can sort of see through it. It's not like a stout, which we're going to do next, that is very black. opaque. It is black. This yeah. is more a really, really dark brown or red. Yeah. Actually, if you hold it up to the light. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful it's kind of, red. It's a beautiful red. Yeah. Just a really dark red. So, yeah, and so in the grain bill, when you do this, you know, you add standard grains, but then you add some specialty grains in there. And usually these specialty grains are a little bit more uh, highly roasted. And so that's how you end up getting the dark color. So again, don't let your, uh, I guess, as we say, drink with your eyes, because this beer is not any heavier than, than, uh, other beers, it just has a little bit of the dark grain in there to give it color. Um, so, oh boy, that's got a good kind of almost a coffee chocolate yeah. aroma to it. Mm. I sat down yeah. on the lifeguard stand with my boys last last uh, spring, drinking this very beer. Oh, is that right? Yeah, <laughs> we have uh, we have a tradition that uh, one night on our spring trip up to the lake, we, we go sit on the lifeguard string, stand <laughs> and drink beer. That's good. <laughs> and uh, this was last year's beer. Is that right? Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah, you gotta add meaning to your to all your beers, yeah, right? Exactly. Well, and now, you know, we do this, you can razz me about bringing an Imperial IPA to, you know, a place. <laughs> So yeah, so alcohol. What is this guy? This is a. This is a. This is five to six. Yeah. I remember right. I need the young eyes to see this. I actually do have glasses. Steve. Probably. What's the alcohol? <laughs> it shows up. Yeah, and I don't think there's a. Six. 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 Okay. Okay. I don't think there's a requirement that they have to put those things on there anymore. Uh, I think it depends on the state. Okay. Uh, yeah. Illinois requires it. Uh, I'm not sure other states require it. Hmm. Uh, okay. Huh. Um, yeah, but no, this is this is a nice beer. A nice beer. Actually, so we have uh, down at Patent Block, we, uh, Steve right now is transferring our porter we brewed a couple weekends ago. Uh, into it's very our, similar our to carbonator. That, oh, yeah. Good. Well, this is a great classic example here. Um, but one of the things that we're going to do is we sometimes like to add a little vanilla flavoring. And so a vanilla porter, and I know Breckenridge is very popular with a, a vanilla porter. I had to make a choice between a vanilla porter or this Edmund Fitzgerald porter. You chose wisely. Yeah. Yeah, and again, we don't necessarily like to adulterate our beers, but it really does kind of add if it if it's a flavor that blends well with it. And so this one does vanilla adds in pretty good. Yeah, it's um, like we do a we do a wheat uh, that we add some tangerine flavor to. That's, that's yeah, it's pretty pleasant. And that's a that's a good sort of balance and flavors. But one of the things we're going to try with this next batch also is to add a little bit of a coconut flavor. So. We'll see how that that plays out. Uh, yeah. I don't know if it's give if it a it, shot. If it's good, we'll keep it. If, if not, it we'll pretend like we dropped it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, let's see here. 
But um, the interesting thing is that the, the, the yeah, color, we did a, that. we did a, uh, mm. a dark cream ale. Cream ale. Was it cream yeah. ale? Yeah. A, a few right. years ago. And we called it lying eyes because, you know, lying. we hear all the time that, oh, that's way too flavorful uh, because it's dark. Well, the, the dark cream ale tasted yeah. just like a cream ale, but it was, it was black. Yeah, it was essentially, this was the cream ale that was just, I don't know what we called it, Spotted uh, Scott. Spotted Scott or something. <laughs> but then then the other one, which just had a little bit of grain that actually added no roasted No flavor at it. all. It just changed just the color. It was list, color. But it was the exact flavor. If you, if you were blindfolded, you couldn't tell yeah. the difference between those. One of the few so. times we had an inventive name for one of our beers. <laughs> oh, you know, we didn't do that. Somebody else must have come up with that. Yeah. Or was it you? That was me. Actually. Oh, was it? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> that was actually mine. Most of the time it's Adam. But, yeah. Adam but, is our, our naming guru. <laughs> yeah. Adam, Adam Sandberg. So. Hmm. Hmm. All right. So, hey, uh, Jen, do we have any questions? We do have some questions. Okay. Uh, Gary Sears asked, are there any commercializers that taste like craft beers? Any commercializers? Any commercializers that taste like a craft beer? Well, so the, so yeah, so the macro brews, you know, the big boys who have been around for a long time, they're actually starting to buy the craft beer labels right uh, yeah they bought who did they, they they bought one up in chicago well and yeah inbev bought out goose island which is i mean goose island was a you know a relatively regional brewery in there so so yeah so what they don't try to do because you know there's still the majority of beer drinkers are the macro beer drinkers and they have a preference for coors light or miller light or bud light and so uh, I mean, we see that in the restaurant that we sure. carry all those sort of macro light beers and there are people who want one over the other. So I think instead of the big commercial guys trying to make like an IPA or some sort of crafted beer, what they're ended up doing is just buying the smaller breweries and kind of, you know, uh, bringing those aboard. Right, right. But actually, I guess... Uh, Blue Moon is a good example that Blue Moon is a pretty macro beer. You can pretty much get it everywhere. And it started off actually at the baseball field in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Denver, Colorado. Really? So yeah, they were, the, it was called the Sandlot. I think it was called the Sandlot or Sandbox or something like that. Hmm. And so Blue Moon started there and then got so famous, they went pretty big. And well, that's Sam a, Adams is another one. Yeah, Sam Adams. Uh, mm -hmm. you could you sort of blurs the distinction between a macro brewery and a and a micro brewery but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a really tasty beer yeah and and again one of the things about the macro or the big commercial brewers they are technically the 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 experts in what they do and again we kind of joke about that i'll, I'll give them great credit for their technical expertise and then I, I ruin it by saying that they make an, a product that has absolutely no flavor. <laughs> well, they, they work really hard to make a beer that has no flavor, yeah. right? I mean, and if there was anything wrong with it, you'd, you'd know taste it. it would be right in your face. But right. they are, are perfect at doing that. Well, actually, actually I, I don't know whether you knew this. You probably do. But uh, most of the macro brewers have an off label where mm -hmm. if it doesn't taste exactly the way Budweiser or whatever oh, it really? is supposed to be. Oh, I didn't know that. Then they, then Steve, they sell Steve, you're keeping these, these nuggets of goodness from they, you. They sell it as stag beer or... Oh. Or, uh, you know, I so, love stag. What are you well, talking? I know. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, my uh, my ex father in law worked huh. for uh, several of the. Um, I know macro Miller was big up in Wisconsin. There. Was, uh, well, this was St. Louis. Oh, there's St. Louis. Okay. Uh, but uh, but yeah, they they bought up some of the some of the smaller brewers, 
And then when they have a batch that doesn't taste exactly the way they want it to taste, then they sell it as stag or, or yeah. blats or one of some <laughs> of the other. Uh, uh, or put it in a giant can and call it a tall boy. Something like that. Like yeah. Schlitz tall boys. Schlitz. I think Schlitz <laughs> ended up in, in Strohs. I mean, many of the beers that we, yeah, that at least I grew up with. I don't know whether I yeah. Wow. Whether that dates you, but uh, I grew up with Meister Bra. Oh, yeah. I actually remember one. stealing a bottle from my dad's collection because they were the returnable bottles. Okay. Right. They weren't, you know, they had that kind of hard cardboard case um, that, uh, so he kept track of them. I'm sure he probably knew that I took that, that, one, but, that one, but I didn't take too many. I was a smart kid. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, Jen? No. All right. Well, so uh, actually, uh, so uh, we might, well, well, we might save that one. I think we should just stay on track here. So um, this beer right here is the Goose Island Bourbon Barrel Stout. And actually here, I got to, let me come around here, Steve. Let me show these folks uh, that this beer has a born on date there. It's uh, vintage handwritten, label. right? So this is a 2020 date and uh, it's 14%. Uh, yeah. Where does it say that? I don't know. I read it somewhere. Yeah. So, so this, this uh, bottle of beer usually, so they say, on this label that this beer can age for five years before you should just make sure you drink it, I guess. I don't okay. know. So, um, but I have to admit, I got this one. Uh, it's usually maybe 12 to $18, but I got it for five bucks because sometimes the grocery stores you know, they're not selling them as fast and they want to get them off their shelf. So they just go, ah, oh, we'll sell it for five. And so I, I have a few bottles like this that I store at home. Hey, and, Steph, uh, good friends. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so one of the things you could do is you can, you could collect them. You could buy like a 12 pack of these, a case, they come, they're a little bigger. So, but you could do it in, in 2018, you could do it 2019, 2020, and then you do what's called a vertical tasting. So you could actually open all three, the 18, 19, 20, and, uh, and sort of contrast the differences because they do evolve over time. You need to so, have a lot of friends for that. Yeah. Well, and, and I got, the, I got the, uh, or the other one that people save and put beer away is the Bigfoot Barley Wine from Sierra Nevada. So I actually have some 2015, about old 2016. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. Um, so, so the thing is, is that when you do a vertical tasting, though, and uh, what you end up doing, though, is uh, it has to be the same recipe. So that's the thing with the Bigfoot, is that they they vow to do the same recipe every year. Okay. And this beer for us is not chilled. It was in my basement and we're cracking out the, uh, the, uh, the brandy snifters here for this. So, uh, yeah. And as Steve said, this is 14% alcohol. So, uh, not, uh, so again, with something like this, where you can really develop an aroma, Woo. Sure, smell the bourbon. Yeah, so this is this was uh, aged in a bourbon barrel, and by that they uh, mean that they have a bourbon barrel, and there's quite a bit of bourbon already in there before they add. <laughs> I mean, it's illegal to to age in a burp or to add bourbon to a beer, but it's not illegal to add beer to a bourbon barrel that has beer in it that has bourbon in it and sometimes they're probably not very good at getting the bourbon out because you know apparently not <laughs> so yeah so bring your whiskey whiskey snifferters out and uh yeah it smells really good 
Yeah. So these these imperial stouts. So again, that term imperial just means that it's it jumps the alcohol way up there. So so again, like this IPA here that was 10 percent. I mistakenly grabbed an imperial stout, or excuse me, an imperial IPA instead of just a standard IPA. Um, but these imperial stouts, opposed to just a standard stout, again, a stout could be actually one of the most common ones, the Guinness dry stout. That's only like actually, four and a half. Yeah, it's really low in alcohol. <coughs> so, um, but these guys, there's a lot of work that goes into getting them up to that 14%. And some of our yeast friends. Yeast uh, friends don't like this. Yeah, yeah. And so again, remember when we talked about that, the yeast does not want to ferment something out to that high. And so you really do have to work hard. You have to repitch this on a second or maybe even a third attempt. Um, I wonder how much of that alcohol is actual beer and how much of it is <laughs> the bourbon that's left over in the barrels. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's, it's, just it's in Bev. You know, they got to follow all the rules, Steve, right? Yeah. yeah so, right. Uh, <laughs> or pay somebody to allow them to not. Mm. That too. <laughs> but one of the things you'll note from this very high gravity beer, high alcohol beers, especially in these, these stouts, is that there's almost a sweetness that is, is present. And that's actually from the alcohol. So when you're up in that above 10%, it really does get really? kind of a sweet flavor to it. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. this is uh this is a very warming beer. <laughs> this would be a nice beer. Snowing outside in a nice, yes. a nice snowy, cold Monmouth, <laughs> Monmouth Saturday. Well, and, and you know, one of the greatest things about beer is that it brings people together, right? I mean, here we are talking to you guys and Steve and I are hanging out. We got Steve Diston with us and the, and Jen and uh, Jordan upstairs, right? I mean, we all come together around these things and we talk about these things. And so, um, yeah, you don't have to get all nerded out with beer and all those details to just sit around and something like this, you got to have at least four friends to, uh, to share it. Otherwise, you, or be home. Or you, yeah. Well, you should definitely have a designated driver, maybe. But just just a little six ounce pour is about all you need. So it really is. Yeah. I mean, so. and this is the kind of beer that you can pour at uh, at six o'clock, sit down and watch a movie, and still be drinking it at nine o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, yeah, and just uh, the sniff is almost. <laughs> better than the drink <laughs> right <laughs> yeah so anyway so uh i we've gone through our list uh, we saved a little bit of time for discussion afterwards um if there's any of that discussion uh, we would be happy to turn it over to jordan and uh have her moderate the rest of this event absolutely so at this time i'm going to um, promote everyone so that you're able to show your video and your sound. Um, so if you want to just chat or you've got questions for Brad and Steve, this is the time to do it. So um, look on your screen here in just a moment and you should see something pop up allowing you to turn on your screen. Just a few more. All right, so everyone should have received an invite now if you're interested. Um, there's a question in the chat about sharing the link for the tasting. Um, so what I'll do is I'll put that link um, in the chat so that you can click on it and it'll open up to a PDF with all of the different types of um, beverages that Brad and Steve presented on today. And then If you're interested in turning on your camera and just chatting, please feel free.
So what's the next beer you think we're going to have at Pat? Ah, uh -huh. um, well, actually, let's see. So, and sorry, I didn't get the grain order today. Maybe I'll do it later. No, no. Yeah. I, didn't get, I didn't get the hops <laughs> order either. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't feel too bad. That's good. Good. This is truly our second job, right? Right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, so we're in the process, I think, of reformulating our pale ale, which is just a very everyday drinking beer. And again, you know, we kind of feel it's important to have uh, on tap some flagship beers that uh, are not over the top, but just sort of part of educating the community about craft beers. Um, but the, the other thing we, I think I'm pretty certain we're going to try, and we forgot to talk about this last night, is to do that sour. So uh, when you're looking through the craft beer section, you'll often see a sour beer. And so that sourness is actually, uh, you might think of it as vinegar, but vinegar is acetic acid. Um, when you do a sour in a beer, you're actually getting a lactobacillus to make lactic acid. And, and lactic acid is a little more, well, it's not as aggressive as acetic acid is. And so tastes it's better. a little smoother. Yeah. Tastes better. Yeah. So it tastes, tastes a lot better. So, but um, it's, it's kind of a thing right now to do sour beers, especially during the summer when it's nice and hot. They're usually very refreshing. Um, but one of the things we're going to do is we're going to partner with the educational garden here at the college and they have uh, raspberries and blackberries that are going to be coming on here in about two to three weeks. And so uh, adding in uh, some generous amounts of raspberries uh, into that sour beer should uh, be a great vehicle to just drink pure raspberry juice. What's that sour <laughs> beer out of Belgium that's raspberry. Oh, the, the Lambic, the Lambic. Linemans. Yeah. Linemans. Uh, yeah, if you're in the... If you're into sour yeah. beers, that's that's a, a taste to behold. And that's got to be like, I, I don't say this often, and I probably say it more than I should, but it is a really amazing beer yeah. because I, that flavor, and they just, have a peach one too. Just, just reaches out and grabs you yeah i mean there's no when you drink that beer there's no question <laughs> what flavors are there yeah yeah um yeah and and i i'm so attracted to the raspberry that if i would buy a bottle of Linneman's lambic i couldn't do anything but raspberry because right. again there's they have other i think they have a, a peach i think there might be a pear version of it um but I, I've never tried those. I just go straight for the raspberry lambic. So uh. <laughs> one of these years we need to do that for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> I have, we have a question. Okay, question. Happy day. Uh huh. I have a double double quarter, seventeen percent. What does double double mean? And is this so high because it's a double double? Yes. 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 <laughs> Yeah, we'll say that twice. Yeah, mm -hmm. we'll both say it. Yeah, double seventeen. Double, yeah, double <laughs> means basically double the alcohol. So if you went from, you assume that uh, a normal quarter might be in the six range, so double would get you to twelve, and then double double would get you to seventeen. That's right on the edge of what meets will. Will uh, yeah, seventeen is pretty high. Yeah, um, yeah, and if you're if you're a Belgian, they, so, okay, actually, so you might be able to find a Belgian beer that's called a quad. So your double-double is essentially a quad. Okay. So, and a triple, you know, right? So you have a standard beer, you have a double, you have a triple, and you have a quad. Um, so, yeah, they keep changing. There, there's no official number associated with a double or with a triple or for a quad or double double. Um, these are there a lot of that stuff is marketing when you start naming it. But 17, that must have cost you a pretty penny too, uh, is my guess. Probably in a four pack or if it was a single bottle, right? I mean, yeah. So enjoy that. You need to get your brandy snifter out for that. 
<laughs> so Cassie also says, my favorite sour, and I apologize about the pronunciation, is it Dussage de Bourgeon? Okay. Is that for those French I words? Ah, you're yeah. doing as good as us. <laughs> it's not the shoot. Oh, Duchess de Bourgogne. There by going. Okay. Is that, is that from that Iowa brewery? Right. Shoot. The, 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 no, Duchess. Duchess. Yeah. It's the it's a Flanders Irish Oh, it's a Flanders. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So Flanders Reds are outstanding, and and Steve and I have accidentally made a Flanders Red. <laughs> we did. Uh, we had a little mishap where our red ale. Uh, yeah, really, 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 really sour. It got sour. But when you left, let it sit for a while, mm -hmm. that kind of, yeah, and it was like, well, we can't throw this away, but we can't sell it. So we drank. Yeah, we bottled it. I think there might still be some over the brewery. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Flanders Red is a very popular style, but it's a little hard to come by. Um, yeah, those are uh, those. Are those uh, uh, monks who were making those, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, you've, you've got some pretty nice beers over there, it sounds like. That's amazing. <laughs> um, actually, so let me come back to that double, triple quad. So uh, when I first got here in 2007, again, I was a home brewer at the time, and we would... Uh, when you homebrew, you essentially take your grains, you put your water in there, and then you take all that sugar water off. And there's still a lot of sugar water in the grain still. So what you do is pour more water in there and rinse it off in order to get your, uh, your amount of water or your amount of sugar water then to carry out your beer. So there's something called a party guile style of brewing where what you do is the what you call the first runnings so you put all this grain in the bin, you throw some water in there, you mash it and you get all the sugars out of there. But then whatever comes out the first is usually very, very high in sugars. And so you take that and you put it aside and then you rinse and then you take that and put it aside. And so you end up making two beers out of one batch and that's called a party guile brew. And so the party or the, the initial beer is probably closer to 10%, whereas the second one is sort of three to 4%. So when you do these two batches side by side, you know, after cutting the grass or during cutting the grass or thinking about cutting the grass, you have the three to 4% alcohol beers that are nice and cold and you can knock those back. When it's time to go to bed, that's when you get your brandy snifter out, find a friend and take your uh, other party guy on and uh, split it uh, for the big sure beer. <laughs> so, yep. Mm -hmm. I like to drink this beer. This you can just bring glass. it home. You this just kind of glass. Yeah. That makes a big difference. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, as, as the... <clears throat> The beers, I have a few extras. I'll note that Steve has very few extras. If you give him a glass, he feels responsible to drink it. <laughs> it's like eating your bees on the plate. Yeah, well, there you go, yeah. But when they do warm up, though, too, they kind of get a slightly different character, and you get a little bit of aroma in there. So that's what I'm kind of like sticking my nose over here and going, mm, that's okay. That's still a little bit different, so... Uh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, again, it's been uh, fun. We've enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next year. We'll come up with some. Uh, I don't know. We'll tell you how that raspberry sour goes yeah. and <laughs> you can make it down. It should be on tap in maybe six weeks or so. I hope. Uh, maybe. Raspberry sour. Yeah. The raspberry sour. We the that. kettle sour. Okay. We're doing yeah. We're good. Soon. Oh, okay. Yeah. Soon. We're good. I hope. Well, the raspberries are going to be right. here in three okay. weeks. Yeah. That's what they tell me out of the garden. So. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, we'll Jordan, check back on the, to you. Perfect. <laughs> we'll check on those raspberries for you tomorrow, actually, because we'll be doing um, a tour of the educational garden farm here well, on campus. Yes. So we'll we'll check up on those with you 
um, tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Central Time. The link is located on the Monmouth College website if you'd like to join us. Um, for a full listing of all of our Golden Scots events, they're all also on the Monmouth College website. Thank you everybody for joining us this evening and a special thanks to Brad and Steve for hosting for us. Everybody, thank you and have a great evening. Go Scots. Thank you. <laughs>